Tonight, the midterms less than one month away and the battle for Congress heating up. In Battleground, Pennsylvania, Dr. Oz versus Lieutenant Governor John Fetterman. Fetterman sitting down with our Dasha Burns for his first interview since suffering a stroke. His campaign requiring a computer with closed captioning for the interview. But he says he's more than able to serve the state of Pennsylvania if elected. Tonight, Dasha joins Top Story Live with more from that headline-making interview. Plus, the GOP showed support for Herschel Walker in Georgia, despite the former football greats of abortion scandal. So what can voters expect over the next four weeks? Chuck Todd is here. Also, the flooding emergency in Central America. A family, including a small child, rescued from neck deep waters after the remnants of Hurricane Julia devastated the region. The death toll rising tonight and another system bringing deadly mudslides to Venezuela. Revenge missile strikes, rockets battering Ukraine for a second straight day as the G7 held an emergency meeting to address the escalation. Richard Engel in Ukraine for Top Story Tonight. Plus, the trial begins for the source behind the infamous Steele dossier, the Russian analyst behind many now discredited allegations made against former President Trump. Will this be the end of a years-long legal saga? Serial charges dropped. Adnan Syed, a free man after prosecutors dropped the criminal case, made famous in a hit podcast. The lack of DNA evidence, they say, cleared him of the crime. And a jump start on holiday shopping, the deals Amazon is rolling out for an early Prime Day to help consumers fight record high prices. Top Story starts right now. And good evening. Countdown to the midterms. The critical race is less than a month away, with both Democrats and Republicans hoping to take control of Congress. And tonight, the NBC News exclusive interview that is sending shockwaves through the selection cycle. In Ohio, the first debate for the state's open Senate seat. As of now, Republican J.D. Vance only has a razor-thin margin over his Democratic challenger. And in Georgia, key Republican Senators Tom Cotton and Rick Scott set to campaign alongside Herschel Walker, the former football great continuing to deny allegations he paid for an abortion. Abortion expected to be a top issue for voters. It will be the first election cycle since the Supreme Court overturned Roe versus Wade. But all eyes are on Pennsylvania and the critical Senate race there. Republican Dr. Oz gaining ground against the swing state's Democratic Lieutenant Governor John Fetterman. Oz has challenged Fetterman's health after he suffered a stroke during the primaries. We want to begin with Dasha Burns and her exclusive report. She sat down with Fetterman for his first interview since that stroke. We want to take note because of his health. His campaign required closed captioning technology for this interview. Can voters trust that you will be able to do this job on day one? Yeah, of, of course. This is Pennsylvania Democratic Senate candidate John Fetterman's first in-person sit-down interview since a stroke sidelined him from the campaign trail for months. That auditory processing where you know, I'll hear someone speaking, but sometimes it'll be able to be uh, precise on what exactly that they're saying. I use captioning. His campaign required that he be allowed to use a transcription program on his computer during our interview. I always thought I was pretty empathetic, uh, uh, emphatic. Uh, I think I was very, excuse me, empathetic. Uh, you know, that's an example of the stroke, empathetic. Yeah. I, I always thought I was very empathetic uh, before having a stroke. But now after having that stroke, I really understand, you know, much more kind of the challenges that Americans have day in and day out. So you say you're on the road to full recovery. But right now, voters really have to take your word for it. We've asked for your medical records. We've asked to have a conversation with someone from your medical team to interview your physician. You've declined those requests. Why? Well, I, I feel like we have been very transparent in a lot of different ways. When our doctor has already given a letter saying that I'm able to serve and to, to be uh, running. I mean, respectfully, that letter from your physician, that was six months ago. Don't voters deserve to know your status now? Being on in front of thousands and thousands of, of people and having interviews and getting around all across Pennsylvania, that gives everybody and the voters decide, you know, if they think that it's, it's really the issue. Polls show Fetterman's lead is shrinking against Republican Dr. Mehmet Oz. It's now a toss-up race that could determine control of the Senate. 
Republicans focusing on crime, in particular Fetterman's votes on the parole board. Fetterman says he's trying to get as many criminals out of prison as he can. Including votes in favor of paroling convicted murderers. Are you soft on crime? Uh, of course not. I'm actually effective on crime and I believe in second chances uh, and I've run on that record. Meanwhile, Fetterman going after Dr. Oz on abortion rights. Dr. Oz likes to make fun of me that I might miss a word, but you know, he's missed, you know, two words and that is a yes or no on the national abortion uh, ban. If you're going to be our next senator, you have to give the answer. All right, Dasha Burns joins us now live from Pittsburgh tonight. So Dasha, I think a lot will be written about your exclusive and how the campaign decided to do this. Can, can you walk us through exactly what was happening again and, and what he was looking at, at on that screen after you asked each question? Yeah, Tom, this was always an unconventional candidate, right? But this interview was quite unconventional. I actually spoke to Fetterman back in May before the primary, before the stroke at his home. This was the same venue, but a very different context. In order to understand my questions, he had to use this closed captioning technology, essentially uh, programming that, uh, that transcribes my questions so he can read them in real time. He's dealing with what's called an auditory processing issue. It's a common symptom of strokes. It means that he has a hard time understanding what people are saying verbally. So if he reads the question, then he can understand. Um, he also, as you heard in that interview, has still some lingering speech challenges. That Those are all symptoms that, you know, when we've talked to stroke experts, they say um, people can fully recover from. The caveat, though, that every doctor you'll talk to will give you is they can't fully assess a patient unless they have those medical records, unless they have details on their condition, which we as of yet don't have, Tom. I, I think regardless of where you stand politically, you, you definitely feel for someone who's recovering from a stroke. I, I do have to ask you, in exchanges yeah. you had with him, could he carry on a conversation without the use of the computer? Well, Tom, you interview candidates all the time. You know sort of the behind the scenes small talk that you might have before the cameras all are rolling. I'll tell you that in those exchanges beforehand, without the captioning, before that technology was up and running, it wasn't clear that he was understanding our conversations. And, and you can imagine that the challenge that uh, might pose for a candidate on the campaign trail talking uh, to voters. But again, something he can recover from, but it certainly seemed as though he, he was having a hard time with those conversations before the closed captioning. So so I guess then the question becomes, and, and you've covered th this campaign and, and this election for so long, how, how would a debate happen? Yeah. Well, he will be using closed captioning at the debate. He agreed to one debate with his Republican opponent, Dr. Mehmet Oz. It'll be on October 25th. A closed captioning will be used during that debate. And I asked him in the interview if he is committed to showing up on that stage no matter what. And he said yes. He said, of course, he's going to be there. As the Senate race heats up in Pennsylvania, national Republicans campaigning in Georgia today for embattled candidate Herschel Walker. The boost in support coming after a week of bad headlines for Walker and allegations that he paid the mother of one of his children to have an abortion. The former football player fighting back against those claims as Ohio Senate candidates face off against each other for their first debate. NBC News Chief White House correspondent Peter Alexander has the latest. Tonight in Georgia, Republican reinforcements arriving to bolster embattled Senate nominee Herschel Walker. It's especially good to be here with the next United States Senator from Georgia, Herschel Walker. Key Senators Tom Cotton and Rick Scott standing by the former football great as he faces an allegation that he paid for an abortion for an ex-girlfriend more than a decade ago while now campaigning on his opposition to abortion rights. Walker has strongly denied the accusation, but today for the first time publicly acknowledged he now knows who the woman is. The Senators tonight insist the controversy will not cost Walker the race. Inflation, crime, our, you know, parents not being involved in schools. I mean, that's what people are going to vote on. Still, some state Republicans have criticized Walker. Lieutenant Governor Jeff Duncan writing, Walker has not yet earned my vote. He has four weeks left to change our minds. While overnight, another critical clash over Ohio's open Senate seat. In their the first debate, Democratic Congressman Tim Ryan accusing tax Republican tax J.D. Vance of lavishing praise on former President Trump. Ohio needs an ass kicker. 
not an ass kisser. While Vance attacked Ryan for voting 100% of the time with President Biden, who remains unpopular with Ohio voters. We're getting close to Halloween, and Tim Ryan is put on a costume where he pretends to be a reasonable moderate. Peter Alexander joins us now. Peter, I want to pick up where you just ended there on that debate last night in Ohio. At first, it started about the economy and the issues, then it turned pretty personal. What are yeah. both campaigns saying about each respective candidate's performance last night? Well, the campaigns, I think, Tom, feel good about their performances last night. You certainly heard from J.D. Vance there trying to cast Tim Ryan as a creature of Washington after 20 years serving there. Ryan says he's not going to back away from his years of service helping support what has been one of the most economically hard-hit parts of his state. But notably, Ryan also did try to really distance himself from President Biden, Tom, saying that he does not believe the president should run for re-election in 2024. He said that Donald Trump shouldn't run either. He said that America needs generational change, Tom. Yeah, but a very bold statement there from, from a Democrat. Um, I do want to talk about another debate that we're going to have Friday. If you're a political junkie, this is likely pay-per-view watching mm -hmm. Walker uh, versus Senator Warnock. Herschel Walker, of course, facing off on Friday night, which, Peter, I, I believe is going to be their only debate uh, of this campaign. Yeah, you're right. It is the one and only debate, and really it is the last chance for voters to get to see the two men, first and only chance to see the two men side by side. Obviously, abortion has got a lot of the national headlines, given the recent allegations surrounding Herschel Walker, but there are a lot of issues that I anticipate will come up in the course of this conversation, issues that are pocketbook ones, like inflation and the economy. Certainly, the topic of crime is one that Raphael Warnock may have to defend against some of the criticism Democrats have faced as well. And by the way, this matters tremendously in in this race because early voting, Tom, begins on Monday. All right, Peter Alexander for us tonight. Two big reports from the campaign trail, so let's get some analysis now. NBC News political director and moderator of Meet the Press, Chuck Todd, joins Top Story tonight. So, Chuck, we'll get to that Fetterman interview in just a moment that's been making so many headlines. But I want to start with Peter's report, the big debate in Ohio. The real clear politics polling average has J.D. Vance up by less than two points. Within the margin of error in a state, former President Trump won by eight points in 2020, as you know. CNBC has reported that mega donor Peter Thiel has told fellow supporters that he thinks this race is won. He's moving his money to the Arizona Senate race. Do you think this is J.D. Vance's race at this point to lose? It is, and it's simply the nature of Ohio. I just was there for two days myself last week, Tom, doing some reporting mostly out of Cleveland in that area and talking with some insiders there. And everybody says the same thing, whether they're Republicans or Democrats, whether they want, you know, Ryan to win or not. And that is this. Tim Ryan, they say it's already, he's won the campaign, and now we're going to find out, can he win the election? Meaning, he's out campaigned Vance. He does it better. They, I talked to one Republican who was really critical of just Vance's skills as a campaigner, that he's a first-time uh, uh, campaigner and has a team around him that doesn't seem to know how to do this, doesn't know how to guide him. And I remember asking this person, is, do you think this is a Vance issue? And he said, no, he thinks it's a campaign staffing issue around Vance. So... Look, Teal's calculus, he's a very analytical guy, and Teal's calculus is the same calculus national Democrats have made in their decision not to spend a dime to help Tim Ryan. And that is they think there's a hard ceiling for Tim Ryan of about 47, 48 percent, and that might not be the winning number. But guess what, Tom? 48 percent could be a winning number if there's a third candidate that gets, gets a bunch of uh, sort of hold your nose the Republicans that can't bring themselves to vote for Ryan but don't like Vance. For instance, you take a look at a guy like John Tester in Montana. Do you know he's won three times? He's never gotten 50 percent. There's always been a libertarian getting just enough that he can make 48 or 49 a winning number. So Ryan can win, but this is Vance's to lose. Teal made the calculus he made based on numbers. But if Vance makes one more mistake, I don't know if he can, if party registration advantage in Ohio can bail him out. And time clearly running out. I do want to go to, to mm -hmm. Dasha's big interview with Fetterman today. Uh, I want to replay one of the moments where Fetterman seems to have some difficulty. Let's take a listen. Uh, and it, I always thought I was pretty empathetic, uh, uh, emphatic. Uh, I, was, I think I was very, excuse me, empathetic. Uh, you know, that's an example of the stroke, empathetic. Yeah. I, I always thought I was very empathetic uh, before having a stroke. But now after having that stroke, I really understand you know, much more kind of the challenges that Americans have day in and day out. Look, Chuck, I, 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 I'll say it. I, I think you have to be not human to not feel for John Fetterman, mm -hmm. right, when you, when you watch right. that interview. 
I, I am a little confused, though. What do you think went into to the campaign agreeing to this interview, number one? Mm -hmm. Do you think there's any coming back to this? And, and I know a lot of times, and, and we've gotten so cynical in the press, in a post-Trump right. world saying nothing matters, I think this interview matters. Look, I, did, I think it does, too. And I think when you look at the decision they made to participate in a debate, and there's a debate that's going to be in two weeks, and if you look at it through that prism, Tom, then this interview makes sense, right? Which is they want to set some expectations. I don't think they wanted the debate to be the first time Pennsylvania voters heard, you know, in a, in a, in a, in a larger setting, heard him and his, and, his, uh, and his difficulties at times with that. Look, um, that's, you know, I think I've had family members who, I'm a family member who's a recover, recovering from a stroke. So I think anybody that's been familiar with that, that's a very familiar thing. And, it, and you see that everything's, He's got everything he wants to say up here. So, you know, I think because they agreed to a debate and that it's going to be an, an awkward moment or, or so, perhaps, I think that's why they did this interview. Look, I think it's they could have easily decided not to do a debate or any of this, Tom. Tim Johnson, a former senator who had a stroke while in office, he ran for reelection and he essentially avoided talking to media and he was able to succeed. Uh, so. I think they deserve credit for being trans more transparent about this, but I also think there was a necessity for it, given that this took place while he was campaigning. So I think they kind of needed to do this in order to close the deal with any voter that may not be, that may be on the fence over this. Um, but again, I look at this decision to do this interview through the prism of the decision to do the debate. Once they agreed to do that, I think they felt they needed to, number one, give him more uh, practice doing uh, interviews in real time like this, and two, to sort of set the bar of expectations a little Chuck, bit. Chuck, explain this, and this may be too technical of a question, but I think you could probably explain mm -hmm. this to our viewers. It, it, would it be too late for Democrats to find another candidate, or do Democrats think Fetterman can get through this? Um, it would, look, it's too late to replace him on a ballot uh, at this point in time. Usually those deadlines are, are usually closer to about 60 days due to overseas ballots. Most of those deadlines are at the end of August these days, right at the beginning of September. There was some chatter about that, for instance, in Georgia among Republicans. In August, believe it or not, there was some small chatter. Hey, could they convince him to get out? No, I do think, and I, and I do think that Fetterman has, again, for anybody that has had a family member have a stroke that deals with some speaking difficulty after, you know everything's being processed up here. It isn't an issue of communication in writing, communication in thinking. It's communication in speaking. Um, if that's the only issue, I think this is something that voters, uh, um, as long as they feel that he's everything is competent uh, outside of the speaking issue, I think it is something that he can overcome with voters. We're, we're going to have to wait and see how voters interpret all of this. There, there, there's still three to four mm -hmm. weeks left in this campaign. I do want to switch gears now. I, I want to pull up a quote from top Democratic strategist James Carville on the abortion issue in the midterms. He said this mm -hmm. to the Associated Press, I believe. A lot of these consultants think that if all we do is run abortion spots, that will win for us. I don't think so. It's a good issue, but if you just sit there and they're pummeling you on crime and pummeling you on the cost of living, You've got to be more aggressive than just yelling abortion every other word. Now, I, I bring up James Carville because James Carville sort of had that come to Jesus moment with Democrats mm -hmm. during the last presidential campaign during the right. primary saying, listen, guys, we, we got to move closer to the center. Do, do you think Carville is right in what he's saying? You know who agrees with him, Tom? Bernie Sanders. Bernie Sanders said an almost identical critique about a couple weeks ago. He said, hey, there's no doubt abortion should be the number one issue Democrats talk about, but it shouldn't be the only issue. You got to talk about the cost of prescription drugs. You got to talk about the cost of living. You got to talk about the economy. So believe it or not, and Carvel and Bernie don't agree on a lot, right? But the fact is, I think it's fascinating that both of them are concerned that he think that Democrats are going um, too much in a one issue direction. Look, I think um, I, I can sit here and, and I could make a case and argue either side of it, Tom. I think it's a, it, it's sometimes if you have a simple message, you stick to it and making the end game thing, hey, look, we've got a lot of problems going on, but this one is your personal rights. Abortion is everything on this election in this moment. Uh, a sim some could argue a simplicity of message for, has a better chance of breaking through than if you're trying to answer on crime, answer on cost of living, and oh, by the way, talk about abortion rights. 
That said, you can't leave a you can't leave an attack unanswered. So I think what Carvel is arguing is, hey, look, your abortion messaging is important. Don't sit here and leave the crime issue unanswered. And I think a guy like Mandela Barnes in Wisconsin waited way too long to start uh, responding to the attacks that he was getting on crime. All right, Chuck Todd, part of our entire political team here dissecting the midterms one month out. We do want to turn to another big story that we're following tonight, the deadly storms devastating Central America. Hurricane Julia dissipating into the Gulf after torrential rain and mudslides left entire cities underwater. Tens of thousands of families affected, many forced to take shelter under bridges. Guad Venegas has more on where this storm is headed and the rescue efforts that are underway. Tonight, the torrential rain continues after Hurricane Julia left a trail of destruction across Central America. Over the weekend, the Category 1 storm crashing into the coast of Nicaragua, then causing life-threatening flash floods and mudslides across the region. Families trapped in their homes, children clinging for their lives, rescued from the neck deep water and heavy currents. Strong winds and raging currents have destroyed bridges and the death toll growing by the day. At least 28 people have been confirmed dead, including 14 in Guatemala and nine in El Salvador. Among the casualties, five soldiers who died seeking refuge in a home where a wall collapsed on them. The country declaring a state of emergency with rivers and dams now overflowing. Over the weekend, entire neighborhoods underwater with communities joining forces and fighting the currents to make rescues, even creating a human chain formed in an attempt to save drivers trapped in the muddy flood waters. The storm affecting over 153,000 people across the region, leaving over 1,600 homeless. It's bastante angustiante vivir todas estas horas, ver cómo los árboles se movían, la brisa, cómo sonaba, toda mi casa se movía, ver los techos de los vecinos, cómo se volaban, cómo la gente gritaba, cómo pasaba, ver qué necesitábamos, eh, son horas eternas. Many forced to evacuate and some brought to shelters like this. Todos los que estamos aquí, estamos que vivimos a orilla de, de ríos. Estamos en alto riesgo. In Honduras, families have taken shelter under bridges and in elevated areas away from overflowing rivers. Me siento triste por todo lo que está pasando. There, at least four have died, one woman getting swept away by the rapid currents, three others dying in their capsized boat. No podemos confiarnos. La verdad la cosa, nos pasó con Eti y Ota, ya no podemos confiarnos. Nosotros tenemos miedo. All right, Guad Venegas joins us now from Miami. Guad, as you mentioned, the storm has since downgraded into the Gulf, but rescues continue across Central America? Uh, that's correct, Tom. And uh, now the U.S. is helping. A spokesperson with U.S. Uh, aid told NBC News that they have activated experts all across Central America. This is essential, Tom, because they will coordinate the logistics between the governments in different countries in Central America and the humanitarian organizations that will be sending help to the area. And we all know what happens after a hurricane. Much help will be needed, Tom. Yeah, a, a growing disaster still there in Central America. All right, Guad, we appreciate it. And another weather emergency in Latin America, the death toll rising after a massive landslide in Venezuela. Rescuers now going with dogs to search for survivors in the north central state of Ar Ar Aragua. Days of heavy rain triggering that landslide on Sunday, wiping out hundreds of homes, at least 35 people killed and dozens more injured. 1,300 families have been impacted so far. Okay, now to the war in Ukraine and Russia's relentless attacks on Ukrainian cities raging on. Russia saying Vladimir Putin's military is training its missiles and lethal drones at critical infrastructure, but new images appear to show the widespread impact on civilian areas. President Zelensky now awaiting assistance from allies to blunt the aerial assault. Richard Engel is there tonight for us in Ukraine. For a second straight day, Russia escalated its war to conquer Ukraine with new missile strikes, including on this building in Zaporizhia. It came just hours before the emergency meeting of the G7, where Ukraine's President Zelensky had one main request, more air defenses. Zelensky saying if Ukraine gets them, Russian missile strikes will cease to work. It follows Russia's strikes on Monday. 
hitting civilian areas with dozens of long-range cruise missiles and drones on a scale not seen since the initial invasion nearly a year ago. A college student was filming a video message in a park in Kyiv when first she heard the sound of incoming. Then a missile exploded nearby. In Lviv, a dash camera caught a Russian missile striking a power station, causing blackouts in parts of the city. Russia attacked at least 12 districts, according to Ukrainian officials, several for the first time in months. Moscow says its latest barrage is retaliation after this weekend's attack on the only bridge linking the Russian mainland to occupied Crimea. Russian media say Ukrainian intelligence detonated a truck bomb and damaged the bridge. Without directly claiming credit, Ukrainians are reveling in the attack, issuing a stamp within hours of the blast, which soon became street art, celebrating President Putin's beloved bridge in flames. Tom, this is a very revealing moment. What we're seeing is the most intense and wide-scale Russian attacks since the early days of the war, since Russia first invaded this country. But in those early days, there were hundreds of thousands of Ukrainians who were terrified. They were fleeing the country. Millions ended up as refugees in Poland and other European countries. Now, similar level of violence but Ukrainians aren't afraid. They're not leaving the country. We just crossed into Ukraine today. We didn't see a single refugee heading in the opposite direction. We saw humanitarian aid workers there waiting for people who never showed up. Instead, it is Russians in the hundreds of thousands who've been leaving the country, Russian men who don't want to sign up and join Putin's war. Tom. All right, Richard Engel, back in Ukraine for us. Richard, we appreciate it. Okay, back here at home to a long-awaited federal trial involving the Steele dossier. It was a political bombshell during the 2016 campaign with some very scandalous claims about then-candidate Donald Trump. While the dossier has now been debunked, the investigation into how the FBI handled that investigation isn't finished just yet. A key source now on trial accused of lying to federal agents. Justice correspondent Ken Delanian has the details. Tonight, what may be the final legal battle in the saga over the infamous Steele dossier. Igor Danchenko, flanked by his legal team, for the trial accusing him of lying to the FBI. He was a key source for private intelligence reports alleging that then-presidential candidate Donald Trump conspired with Russia's election interference operation in 2016. Trump used those charges as a rallying cry to fire up his base throughout the campaign. But I think it's a disgrace. It's just really a very, it's a very sad, it's a very sad commentary on politics in this country. Named after Christopher Steele, the former British spy who compiled it, the dossier has been exposed as largely the product of third-hand gossip. That includes the dossier's most salacious claim, that Trump cavorted with prostitutes at Moscow's Ritz-Carlton Hotel. The indictment says Danchenko lied about how and where he heard that story, a story Trump has always denied. It turned out to be a concocted fairy tale made up by crooked Hillary Clinton, the Democrats, a sleazeball writer named Christopher Steele. The Clinton campaign was fined more than $100,000 earlier this year for failing to properly disclose payments that went to Fusion GPS, an intelligence firm that hired Steele and completed the dossier. The Clinton campaign had no role in writing the document. It was made up, and I understand they paid a tremendous amount of money and Hillary Clinton always denied it. The Democrats always denied it. And now only because it's going to come out in a court case, they said, yes, they did it. They admitted it. And they were embarrassed by it. Special counsel John Durham was appointed in 2019 by then Attorney General William Barr to look into whether the FBI and the CIA overreached while investigating whether Trump was conspiring with Russia. But the three-year investigation has resulted in only one conviction. And in the Denchenko trial, the judge threw out Durham's request to use much of the dossier as evidence, including the prostitution story. All right, Ken Delaney joins us now from Washington. So, Ken, explain to our viewers that last part of your story there. The most salacious aspects of the Steele dossier are also the ones most discussed, even as complete fabrications. What was the judge's thinking about this one and how it could impact the trial? Yeah, Tom, Judge Anthony Trenger really slapped down Special Counsel John Durham on this point. 
The judge ruled that some of the facts Durham wanted to put in front of the jury about that Ritz-Carlton rumor did not qualify as direct evidence and were, quote, substantially outweighed by the danger of confusion and unfair prejudice. He accused Durham of engaging in an unnecessary and impermissible attempt to make this case about more than it is. The judge, who was appointed by George W. Bush, wouldn't let Durham put the dossier on trial. So, so Ken, if you can, tell us where we're going here, because at first you had the Steele report raising the possibility that Trump conspired with Russia's election interference since debunked. Then you have the special mm -hmm. counsel Durham appointed to find FBI and CIA wrongdoing in their investigation for the Russia collusion, which has also resulted in, in only a single conviction. So after all of this, a lot of accusations that have been knocked down, and yet nobody apparently did anything incredibly wrong. What, what, what is going on in this trial? What, what's next? Well, actually, Tom, both special counsel Robert Mueller and a bipartisan Senate Intelligence Committee report found that the Trump campaign did a lot wrong by knowingly accepting help from Russia, even if Trump didn't actually conspire. The Senate report said the Trump campaign left itself open to manipulation by foreign intelligence services and found that the campaign chairman was meeting regularly with a suspected Russian spy. But here's the thing. The dossier played no meaningful role in those investigations, but the focus on its unsupported claims in this trial and elsewhere clearly have made it less likely that any Trump supporter was going to accept those official findings. We're back now with an update on a story that many people have been following for years after more than two decades behind bars. Tonight, the man at the center of the hit podcast serial walks free, prosecutors dropping all charges against him, citing DNA evidence. And while Syed celebrates his innocence, the victim's family is speaking out against the decision. Here's NBC's Maya Eaglin. Tonight, after 23 years behind bars and three weeks on house arrest, Adnan Syed, the man widely recognized from the Serial podcast, is free. Perhaps the final chapter in the years-long saga, Baltimore prosecutors dropping all charges against Syed in the 1999 murder of Heyman Lee, after DNA evidence supported his innocence, officials said. The criminal justice system should be based on fair and just prosecution. And the crux of the matter is that we are standing here today because that wasn't done 23 years ago. State Attorney Marilyn Mosby saying officials tested a skirt, pantyhose, shoes, and a jacket belonging to Lee, and Syed's DNA was not on the evidence. The items that we tested had never before been tested, and we used advanced DNA to determine that it was not Adnan Syed. Syed's attorney, Erica Sutter, reacting to the news. Today is a day that Adnan Syed and his loved ones have been waiting for for 23 long years. I think he's just really elated to be able to have the small, quiet, everyday joys of freedom that many of us take for granted. The prosecution's case unraveling last month after it was discovered that key evidence had been withheld during the original trial, including the existence of two other suspects in the murder. And while Syed's involvement in the case now appears to be over, the murder of Lee continues to be under investigation. We will continue to utilize every available resource to prosecute whoever is responsible for the death of Hey Min Lee. In a statement, the victim's family's attorney expressing their outrage, saying the family received no notice. By rushing to dismiss the criminal charges, the state's attorney's office sought to silence Heyman Lee's family and to prevent the family and the public from understanding why the state so abruptly changed its position of more than 20 years. All this family ever wanted was answers and a voice. Today's actions robbed them of both. A court appeal by Lee's family failing. Last week, they teamed up with Maryland's attorney general to halt Syed's court proceedings, but to no avail. 41-year-old Syed was convicted of murder in 2000 as a teen. Evidence against him included cell phone location data and a police interview with a schoolmate who incriminated Syed. But defenders of Syed's innocence have since argued both were unreliable. The case gained national attention when the hit serial podcast featured him in 2014. Whatever the motivation is to kill someone, I had absolutely... It didn't exist in me. A judge releasing Syed from prison in mid-September. At this time, we will remove the shackles from Mr. Syed, please. Since then, he's been at home with GPS monitoring. Now without shackles and after more than two decades in prison, a man who has always maintained his innocence walks free. Adnan would like to continue his education. I think he has dreams of going to law school. He wants to know, like the rest of us, what really happened. All right, Maya Eaglin joins us now in studio. Maya, so Syed has been set free, charges have been dropped, but someone murdered Heyman Lee. So what, what are prosecutors saying about finding her killer?
So we heard from Baltimore State's Attorney Marilyn Mosby today in a press conference that two more people have been identified as unnamed suspects, but one of those people actually made a threat against Lee's life. She's saying that she's committed to holding the killer or killers accountable and also hopes that the DNA advancements and technologies will continue providing tools and clues to investigators. Okay, and we'll stay on top of this case as they do that. Maya, we appreciate it. When we come back, the sentencing trial for the Parkland shooter, the fate of Nicholas Cruz, set to go to the jury. The final arguments from both sides. All right, we are back now with Top Stories News Feed. We begin with closing arguments in the sentencing trial of Parkland shooter Nicholas Cruz. In their final arguments, prosecutors urging a jury to sentence Cruz to death, saying he meticulously planned the February 2018 massacre at a Florida high school that left 17 people dead. The defense arguing that he is mentally ill and, quote, broken. Jury deliberations are expected to begin tomorrow. Now to that carbon monoxide leak at a Pennsylvania daycare. Firefighters in Allentown say they were responding to reports of an unconscious child when their carbon monoxide monitors immediately went off. 27 people, mostly children, were hospitalized. The center did not have a carbon monoxide detectors, but they say they were in the process of installing them after a new state law required them by the end of this month. And an update to a story we brought you last night. Los Angeles City Council member Nuri Martinez is taking a leave of absence after leaked recordings captured her making racist remarks, including some about her colleague's black son. She has already resigned from her position as the council's president, but today protesters packed the LA City Council chambers, calling for her complete resignation and the resignation of two other lawmakers. Okay, now to a smashing success announced by NASA today. New data showing that mission two weeks ago to knock an asteroid off course went even better than they hoped. And that's the good news for the planet. Here's Tom Costello. From 7 million miles away, photographic proof that NASA's DART mission worked. That exploding cloud of dirt and rock, the moment the refrigerator-sized spacecraft slammed into an asteroid named Dimorphos, orbiting an even bigger asteroid. The impact gave Dimorphos a big shove, dramatically shortening its orbit even more than NASA had hoped. It was expected to be a huge success if it only slowed the orbit by about 10 minutes but it actually slowed it by 32 minutes. Traveling at 14,000 miles per hour, Dart's nose camera caught the final seconds before impact. While the asteroid poses no risk to us, NASA is hoping it can one day use the same technique to divert a massive meteor on a collision course with Earth, a so-called planet killer like the one that killed off the dinosaurs 65 million years ago. Warning time is really key here in order to enable this sort of asteroid deflection to potentially be used in the future. NASA says it's not not tracking any asteroid known to pose an imminent threat to Earth, but there may be others it doesn't see. Ideally, scientists would have decades of warning to use a similar deflection technique and save humanity. All of us have a responsibility to protect our home planet. After all, it's the only one we have. And with that, Tom Costello joins Top Story tonight from Washington. So, Tom, does NASA have any idea how many asteroids are out there in our solar system and how many are close to Earth? And, you know, the big question that I think a lot of viewers are going to have is, can they pull any data, any research from what just happened? And does it give them any confidence that they could stop an asteroid from hitting Earth? Yeah. So there are about 1.1 million asteroids that we know of in our solar system, about 30,000 or so are uh, close to Earth, but none of them right now is thought to be on any kind of a path towards Earth. So that's good news. By the way, they can vary from 350 miles across to 33 feet, right? They're all, sh all shapes and sizes. And NASA really believes that the data that they have now got from this DART mission, incredibly successful, is going to help them in the future to determine, okay, well, how much of a shove do we need to give a, an asteroid based on how big it is, and then how much lead time do we need? Do we need, in, in the words of one uh, expert today, if we had a 100 years warning, a 100 years warning that's coming our way, that would give us plenty of time to have a coordinated planetary defense from multiple countries cooperating. 
A hundred years, just think about that. It's also incredible, and we, and we covered this live, Tom, as you remember, how small that satellite was compared yeah. to the size of that asteroid, and yet it still made a difference. So if you could put this into perspective for us, you know, NASA's had some big accomplishments over the last few years, including the launch of the James Webb Space Telescope yeah. and the landing of Perseverance on Rover, uh, the Rover on Mars, excuse me. So how does this one play in all that over the last three years? Oh, I think, listen, this is going to go in the top 10. I mean, you know, the, the James Webb Telescope, by the way, is, is providing some of the imagery we now have of the impact uh, of DART. Uh, NASA is focusing on going long and going deep, and they're hopefully going to be turning over more and more of the low Earth orbit stuff to the private sector, SpaceX, for example, and, and eventually Jeff Bezos. And then they would like to even turn that stuff over to, for the moon missions because they want to focus on the Mars and on these types of missions that really could involve saving humanity. All right, Tom Costello for us, Tom, we appreciate it. And coming up, the early Amazon Prime deals. We'll tell you the best bargains out there right now from headphones to gifts for the kids to steals on TVs. That's all next. Stay with us. All right, we're back now with Money Talks, what consumers and investors need to know from the business world and beyond. And if you haven't started your holiday shopping just yet, now is your chance to get in on early Amazon deals. Amazon launching its first ever early access prime sale overnight. Tens of thousands of products available today and tomorrow at steep discounts for Prime members looking for a way to beat that sky-high inflation. Joining us now with a cheat sheet for shoppers, our friend Ian Schur. He's editor-at-large for CNET, a go-to site for the latest product reviews and sales. So even everyone's going to ask, what is the best deal right now on some tech products? Yeah, so there's actually a bunch of different stuff that they're offering deals on. And part of this is, of course, getting ahead of the holidays. So for example, we've got for headphones, we've got Apple's AirPods, the second generation ones. So they're a little older, but they are 43% off at $89. Or you can also look at Bose noise canceling headphones. Those go over the ear instead of in the ear. And those are $269. That's almost 30% off. So in both of those cases, those are some pretty big brands that Amazon is cutting the prices on to try and get people's attention. And two great gifts for anyone either to receive or maybe give to themselves. What about products at home that you can use at e inside your house? Sure. So uh, one of the things that we've been seeing a lot of is smart home technology, right? It's getting a lot more popular. So for example, iRobot has their Roomba vacuum. Uh, Amazon's selling that for essentially $200. That's almost 30% off. And then you've also got the original Peloton bike, uh, bike. That's the one where you have to change the settings with your hand instead of it automatically changing. But the price goes down to $1,225. That's the lowest price ever. And and it's 15% off. Uh, of course, you do have to keep in mind, even though it is Peloton and they've got their service and it's very popular, the company is struggling a little bit. So, of course, you're choosing whether or not you're going to stick with them or not. $1,200, though, that's a pretty good price for that bike, I will say. A lot of parents looking to get shopping uh, done for their little ones early. Maybe you got some birthdays coming up. What kind of deals do you have there? Yeah, so there's tons of kids' toys and gifts and all sorts of stuff all the time. And in, in, the, in, the, in the kind of vein of tech, you've got, for example, Madden NFL 23, right? This is one of the biggest games in the, in the video game industry, of course, focused on football during this season. Uh, it is already down a third, so it's down to $44.99. And then also LOL Surprise doll sets, right? LOL Surprise, you may remember, got really popular a couple of years ago because, you know, you got to have these sudden surprises that uh, that you would get out of the toy. And so in this case, they've gone down to thirty eight forty nine, which is 70 percent off. So uh, one of those off. hot holiday gifts. Wow. Yeah, I could have used holiday those gift a from couple a couple of years, years ago. ago. Yeah, I now. have a lot of LOLs at, at our house. So that, but that is that is a good a good deal there. <laughs> and then, you know, I think on these days, because yeah. we've done a lot of reporting on Prime Day sales, Amazon products themselves, you tend to get the best prices on those. Yes. What, what is really great right now to buy? 
Yeah, so when it comes to Amazon products themselves, that is what Amazon always pushes this event the hardest with. So you've got to think of stuff like the Amazon Fire TV, right? That's an Amazon branded television, uh, but they've actually been selling more and more of them. And that one, for example, is actually having a sale where it's 42% off. Uh, it's a 58 inch television down to 279, which is a, a very good deal. And we at CNET have actually found that those TVs are pretty good. So it, it might actually be worth it for you. It's only a 58 incher, but for some people that's plenty. And then uh, the other option is a Kindle Paperwhite, right? This is the e-reader. It's not a tablet tablet. It's a thing that's meant to kind of be like a book and it's black and white. It's the eight gigabyte version. It's nearly 30% off at $100. And almost every big Amazon Prime event, when they're doing the shopping stuff, they always knock these prices down pretty far. So a lot of great deals out there, but are there certain products shoppers should wait a little longer to buy? I mean, is, is there any advantage if you wait a little closer to the holiday? or even Black Friday. Yeah, so the one thing to keep in mind is that because we are in this very weird recession slash inflation environment, one of the things we saw back during the last recession, right, remember that uh, a while back, is that during the holidays, the retailers got really anxious and they started offering better and better deals as we got closer and closer to the holidays. So if you want to play a game of chicken with your wallet, you might get a better deal if you wait. But there are also a lot of retailers out there who are offering to actually guarantee the price for you. So if you buy it now and you end up getting a better price, you know, maybe Black Friday they've got a better price or maybe they start doing a better price on December 20th or whatever, you will actually get the difference if you call them and say, hey, I just saw you were you were advertising this for $15 less than I paid. They'll give you the 15 bucks back. You got to be a super savvy shopper to do that. But I like that. I, I can respect that game. <laughs> Ian Sure from CNN. It Ian, takes thanks effort. so much. We appreciate that. Coming up on Top Story, a legend in Dodger baseball. Go Going out in style, retiring after the team's playoff run, we'll have his story and his legacy right after this. Finally tonight, for generations of Dodgers fans, he is the voice of Dodger baseball. After 64 seasons, Jaime Harin is hanging up his headset. Gotti Schwartz has this look back at the Hall of Fame broadcaster's career and legacy. Watson no tiene hits en cuatro turnos al bate. Steve Howe está listo. Imagine listening to the excitement of a baseball game in another language, not understanding all the words. Está sacando batas elevado al jardín central. But feeling its electricity. Sandro, espera, espera, espera. Y los Dodgers son campeones mundiales. And that is exactly what Jaime Jarín felt when he moved here from Ecuador and went to his first Dodgers game in 1958. And I have never seen 80,000 people in one place and the roar of the people really shook me up. And I said, my goodness, this is baseball. And over the next 64 years, listeners all over grew to love the sound of Jaime Janin's voice explaining America's favorite pastime to a Spanish-speaking audience when the Dodgers offered him a job calling games above home plate. Jaime, what kind of change have you seen when it comes to the fans from when you started to, to today? At the beginning, you know, most of Latinos will go to the bleachers there right field or left field, but now I see Latinos everywhere. In fact, when he first started, only 8% of Dodger fans were Latino, and now every other fan that comes into Dodger Stadium is Hispanic. Dad and I we grew up watching baseball. Baseball was our lives. And the translator between that and him and I was Jaime Adi. And then came the season when the man with the golden voice met a pitcher from Mexico with a screwball for the ages, Fernando Valenzuela. He was the magic arm. But you were the magic voice. Well, uh, I helped him, and also uh, he helped me. Suddenly, Fernando Mania swept the country, and they would find themselves bringing Spanish and the MLB closer than ever before. And we saw so many extra Latinos coming to the ballpark. This month, familiar faces like Valenzuela, Yasiel Puig, and Hollywood icons like Edward James Olmos paid tribute to Hari. Y vamos a despedirlo con un beso. And while his last day was set to be October 5th, the Dodgers could be headed to the World Series. You were supposed to retire this weekend. It looks like the Dodgers want to keep you around a little bit longer. I am like a Rocky Marciano. I am in my corner waiting for the bell to sound for the last round. He says after that, he'll hang up his headset and focus on raising funds for his foundation. My goal will be to give 30, 40, 50 scholarships every year. That doesn't sound like retirement. <laughs> it sounds like you're 
you're going to work to help the community. Oh, yes. It will be work. It will be work, but not baseball. I say that uh, uh, stopping baseball is like uh, closing 64 years of vacation. A decades-long vacation that so many Spanish-speaking Dodgers fans will surely grow to miss. Gotti Schwartz, NBC News. Congratulations to Jaime. We thank Gotti for that story. We thank you for watching Top Story tonight. I'm Tom Yamas in New York. Stay right there. More news on the way. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.